Diana, Princess of Wales, is now divorced and all but discarded by the royal family, yet she remains one of the most popular and admired women in the world. Seemingly intended to take the royal family into the 21st century, she looked destined to follow in the footsteps of the Queen Mother as Queen Consort of Britain and the Commonwealth. But Diana was unable to cope with the turbulence of royal life and she temporarily withdrew from her public duties. Over the next few months, I will be seeking a more suitable way of combining a meaningful public role with hopefully a more private life. Equally unable to stay in the shadows, Diana's retirement was brief. Public adulation had become a powerful substitute for the warmth and affection she found lacking in her marriage. Refusing to go quietly, Diana still deploys her beauty and glamour to devastating effect. She is a limelight stealer of legendary proportion. Diana's charisma has ensured that she will not be a footnote in history, as her enemies intended. Once our future queen, she will be remembered for her special appeal. To many, she is a princess in her own right, one whose charm eclipsed the family who finally rejected her as a non-starter for queen. A princess alone, she rarely meets her former in-laws, and even more rarely does she appear relaxed with them. Disillusioned by her experience of royalty, Diana has turned away from their traditional style. At Viscount Linley's wedding to the heiress Serena Stanhope, Diana's individuality underlined her difficult position, neither totally in nor out of the royal family. On such occasions, she and they must tolerate each other. Then Diana must go her separate way and withdraw once more into the seclusion of her three-story apartment at Kensington Palace. Here, in the echoing emptiness of a palace that was never truly a family home, she tries to dispel her loneliness. One of Diana's problems has been that she has tended to not be able to take being alone at all. I mean, solitude is not something that Diana has found easy to deal with. The minute there's a quietness, she has to get on the phone, she has to make contact with people, has to talk about how she feels. And it is incredibly difficult for her to be in that place of solitude. Diana's future rests on her position as mother of the royal heir and spare, her sons William and Harry, her power base amid the uncertainties of her future. And Diana's status and lifestyle at present still depend on the support of her ex-husband, the Prince of Wales. He gave her many solemn assurances that she wouldn't lose her status. Even in the very early stages, back in the 80s when it was aired a couple of times, the possibility of divorce, he was very concerned that she didn't lose any of her privileges. In stripping Diana of the title Her Royal Highness, royalty lost one of its star performers. Diana's combination of regal dignity and Hollywood allure outshone the staid and formal House of Windsor. This was the last occasion she would join the royal family at a state banquet. Her power to outshine a glittering array of tiaraed and titled heads created undercurrents of rivalry and jealousy, which marred Diana's short reign as queen-in-waiting. Diana rebelled against her husband and his family, which resulted in her eventual divorce. Deprived of the life she should have had, Diana rejected Queen Elizabeth II's style of monarchy and created for herself a symbolic role. I'd like to be a queen of people's hearts in people's hearts, but I don't see myself being queen of this country. But she could actually be a very powerful um, figure behind the throne when William becomes king. She's lost out, I suppose, on um, being at Buckingham Palace, but, you know, they say that's quite drafty and the Queen's very thrifty, so there isn't a lot of heat there. And I think she's got all the things she wants, in a way. And, you know, possessions and houses might not be as important to her, because she's quite rich in her own right. She's not like Zsa Zsa Gabor, who said, I am a very good housekeeper. Every time I divorce, I get to keep the house. But I don't think that this was Diana's worry. You know, she was quite well healed in her own right. How is it 
possible to compensate a princess for the life that was snatched away. Charles made a generous divorce settlement worth today around 17 million pounds. Diana amassed so many sumptuous gowns as Princess of Wales that recently she decided to auction some for charity. Each breathtaking dress was valued for being worn by the woman who was once wife of the heir to the British throne. Diana's wardrobe was vast. When stored, her dresses apparently spanned the width of 10 average terraced houses, and she had a seven-foot rack just for her blouses. But Diana kept the Aladdin's cave of jewels that marked every public triumph and private tragedy of her 15 years as Princess of Wales. Daughter of an aristocratic English earl, Diana is wealthy in her own right. With her Spencer Family Trust Fund and her private collections of memorabilia, Diana may be worth 40 million pounds. Whether they cost two or 10,000 pounds, her gowns were not chosen for their price, but for their bewitching effect. Diana's beauty and glamour was a constant reminder to Charles of the wife he cast aside for another woman. To quote someone, was it Ivan Trump who said, uh, don't get even, get everything. Diana followed the pattern of other rich and underloved wives. Her response to her husband's treatment was to spend, spend, spend. And he, like other dissatisfied husbands, grudgingly paid the price. Diana joined the ladies who lunch, frequenting smart restaurants in an effort to fill the lonely hours while Charles was busy elsewhere. Because she's a rich, rich girl in her own right and comes from this uh, sort of wealthy, wealthy background, I don't think that um, the money was that important. It was the loss of prestige. It was the awful humiliation of the thing going wrong because remember what a fairy tale marriage it all was. Disillusioning for us and above all for her. Starting out with her fiancé in 1981, Lady Diana Spencer could never have guessed the treacherous road ahead. Her naivety matched her readiness to please. Hidden was the magic that would turn her from a shy teenager to a global enchantress. She was a child, a Sloan Ranger of 19, not terribly well educated. I mean, she always herself would admit that the best prize she had at school was for having the finest groomed guinea pig. But she's actually very, very smart. Um, but she was very fragile, I think, then. Um, and she was 20 when she married the heir to the throne, 21 when she produced, you know, first child. It was an awful lot to, to cope with. As we now know, it was almost a sort of medieval arranged marriage. And this girl from the Shires, um, just developed and grew out of control. They thought she was going to be a sort of biddable creature, wearing slightly frumpy but acceptable clothes and smiling and bowing and accepting flowers, but really not doing anything else and bearing an air and despair. But instead, of course, she was this stunning success. And um, it was very difficult for Prince Charles because the whole thing had got completely out of control. And, um, you know, I think he regretted it terribly. I mean, had she stayed behind the scenes, Maybe they'd be married still today.
In looks, Diana is like her mother, Frances Shand Kidd, who was divorced acrimoniously by Diana's father and then lived in virtual exile with her second husband. The loss of her mother from the family home was one of the early causes of Diana's troubled personality. Diana's destiny was shaped by a sense of abandonment. Mothering her younger brother Charles developed Diana's caring side. Her eating disorder, bulimia, began while Diana was a teenager in imitation of her older sister Sarah's problem with anorexia. Later, as Prince Charles' fiancée, she succumbed secretly to her old eating habits when pressures began to mount as she faced the most intensive public scrutiny. She's always been disturbed. I think she's been plagued by demons since she was a child. And if you look back into her childhood and you see the, the difficult upbringing she had and, and the problems that she had as a teenager, uh, long before she came into the royal family, she, she was oh, just right made to be a royal in a crisis. Charles's lack of understanding of Diana, 12 years his junior, sharpened the divisions between them. She wanted a romantic marriage. His needs were more pragmatic. He'd reached an advanced age. He'd, he should have been married 10 years earlier, really. And whether or not there would be an heir and a spare was in some doubt for some time. All they were concerned about was that he marry and marry quickly and that she be a childbearing woman. Diana quickly learned to pretend. Even on her honeymoon, she covered up her doubts and private fears. Diana was um, still very young. She married Charles with very, very little experience and had come from a very shaky background where the main um, nurturers in her life had abandoned her one way or the other. So she was enormously emotionally needy. Well, if she doesn't get her own way, her behavior in the past has been to stamp her foot and, uh, and shout and scream. There an awful lot of rows going behind palace walls. What used to happen was when she felt Charles was drifting away and not connecting, you know, when she was perhaps unhappy or she needed to talk to him about something, instead of doing it and letting perhaps a little bit of breathing space to come between them, she over-demanded. She demanded his attention. She wanted him and wanted him. And the more she grabbed his attention and the, the worse the stunts became, the emotional stunts to get his attention became, the further he went away. He wasn't used to people answering him back. He wasn't used to, in particular, to women telling him what they thought. And he just turned his back on it and got out of the place. He just moved on. And uh, I don't think he ever tried. He, he, he was just perplexed. He couldn't understand someone who, having been told what to do, didn't do it. Diana's obstinacy meant that she lost out to her rival. In Camilla Parker Bowles, Charles had found the perfect confidant who shared his interests, towed the royal line, and never upstaged him. I think Camilla's a very strong, strong lady. Well, she was brought up in a different way. She has different interests. Um, and I think she's had a relationship with Charles that was very um, unthreatening in many, many ways. I mean, it was, Charles himself seems to be better able to conduct a relationship when he doesn't have to make a huge commitment. And there is something about the glamour and the romance of it all that tends to appeal to Charles very much. Um, whereas I think, um, with Diana, maybe the same thing could have happened and he had a wonderful, glorious affair with Diana for years and years and years and she would have become that confidant, you know, the tables would be turned. However, I don't think Camilla would have behaved the same as Diana. I can see Diana fitting into Camilla's role very, very well, but I can't see the reverse happening with Camilla getting very upset at Charles's perhaps interest in other women. She's a much more, she has a less romantic view of marriage. Diana still has a romantic view of, of marriage. Camilla doesn't. The volcanic private relationship between the Prince and Princess of Wales finally erupted in 1992. On their last joint tour, they embarrassed their Korean hosts by their negative and hostile conduct with each other. Nicknamed the Glums, they were never allowed to repeat this pantomime performance, which prompted private Foreign Office apologies to Korea. The couple separated, but still Diana feared leaving the Royal House of Windsor, to which she had given so much. I don't want a divorce, but obviously we need clarity on a situation. 
that has been of enormous discussion over the last three years in particular. So all I say to that is that I await my husband's decision of which way we are all going to go. There are just so many things that contribute to the breakdown of a marriage. You simply can't say it was one thing. It was the jealousy. And remember, two people make a contribution to a marriage splitting. And Diana made a lot of attempts to talk to Charles, to try to make their relationship work, even suggesting that they did things together at one point. She did a lot of work to try to make the marriage look better than it was. And it was Charles's feeling that it was hypocritical to appear in public or to do these little gestures that would make it seem all right. His belief that he should remain true to him, true to what was going on, was actually also part of the reason it kind of gathered momentum. And it may be, again, when we look at the intense media interest, I mean, any of us having a relationship difficulties, if we read about it every day, I think we'd all go galloping towards the courts a lot faster than if we were left, you know, to get on with how we might try to make a relationship better. Diana's shameful friend, her bulimia, was a constant presence during these years. On an official visit to Canada, Diana lived on a diet of chocolate bars and needed medical attention when she fainted during a visit to Expo 86. Charles failed to recognize his wife's condition, forcing her to keep up royal appearances when she needed rest, recuperation and understanding. During their gatherings at royal residences such as Sandringham, family tensions made Diana's illness worse, resulting in cries for help. So you have so much pain inside yourself that you try and hurt yourself on the outside because you want help, but it's the wrong help you're asking for. People see it as crying wolf or attention seeking, and they think because you're in the media all the time, you've got enough attention, inverted commas. But I was actually crying out because I wanted to get better in order to go forward and continue my duty and my role as wife, mother, Princess of Wales. The vows she had made on her wedding day were sincere. To Charles and his family, she gave her youth. But doubts over her husband's loyalty ate away at her, causing destructive jealousy. I was writing my first book in 1981 and I actually used Charles and Diana as an example of a relationship and how you would judge that relationship astrologically. It was a textbook for young astrologers. <laughs> and I found the more I looked at these two charts, the more incompatible they were. And I voiced a lot of concerns in this book. I suggested that there would be marathon icy silences in the halls of Highgrove. And I talked about Diana making a bid for freedom and saying, well, divorce at one time would be unthinkable for a member of the royal family, but perhaps not. You know, I, I definitely thought divorce was a real possibility with these two. In 1986, the year of these posed holiday photos, the royal marriage entered its terminal phase. Diana asked astrologer Penny Thornton for advice. One morning out of the blue, the telephone rang and this voice just said, hello, it's the Princess of Wales. She just wanted to know if there was uh, a light at the end of the tunnel. So it was when I realized that she was in trouble, that this wasn't just someone who was um, just wanted to have a look at their horoscope, which a lot of people do, is kind of self-indulgent trip. Um, I thought, right, she's in trouble. Well, I'll drop everything. And I did, I dropped everything and saw her a couple of days later. When I arrived at Kensington Palace and I sat down and I started to talk about the charts and looked at Charles and everything, when she finally told me the dire straits they were in, it was an extraordinary thing because at one at, on one level she knew I predicted it, or, and yet I was surprised to hear my own prediction. You know, it was, it was the reality of it was was quite something, and it was. Well, she was in a very severe state of distress at that particular time. Herself the product of a broken home, Diana wanted to protect her young children from the emotional turmoil she had suffered. She felt threatened by the royal establishment, which she described as the enemy. Diana leaned very heavily on her astrologer for guidance. One of the difficult jobs you have as an astrologer is communicating the information that you can see. And you really do have to judge what you should say and how you should say it. So it was. I was capable of judging at that time that Diana wanted to know that her marriage would work 
and that she would live happily ever after. So it wasn't at that time I felt appropriate for me to say, I don't think this marriage has got a hope in hell. But really to give her suggestions as to how to manage her relationship better with Charles, because she was doing certain things that were guaranteed to send him skedaddling off in the opposite direction. So I spent a lot of time talking about how they could make it work and how things could improve and giving her a lot of a feeling that she could handle things. What, one of the things that happens, and was certainly happening to Diana, is when people feel helpless, powerless, it's a terrible, what do you do when you feel you have no power over a situation? It's a terrible spiral to get into. So what you have to do is turn that around so that the person, i.e. Diana, can feel as though she does have power, she can do something, there's actually something she can physically do with the situation. And the minute she had some guidelines as to how to start to chep herself out or get herself out of this spiral, she recovered quite. I mean, by the time I said goodbye, I was, I was dealing with someone who felt back in charge again. She was definitely felt she had something to grip onto. Diana turned to a series of male companions. The art dealer Oliver Hoare offered guidance but became embroiled in a scandal involving unsolicited calls to his home. James Gilby, an old friend, was the man in the infamous squidgy tape scandal. And England's rugby captain, Will Carling, allowed his friendship with Diana to create a rift with his wife. They later divorced. Diana's most notorious affair was with guards officer James Hewitt, who came to enjoy his reputation as Diana's lover. She started seeing Hewitt around about the same time as Charles got back with Camilla. Now, obviously, that was convenient all round, especially as far as the so-called enemy were concerned. And um, it's obvious that the palace knew she was seeing Hewitt. For five years, James Hewitt made Diana's broken marriage bearable. Did your relationship go beyond a close friendship? Yes, it did. Yes. Were you unfaithful? Yes, I adored him. Yes, I was in love with him. When their personal life had failed, Charles and Diana were obliged to play their part in royal pageantry, their coldness now scarcely concealed. Resigned to the fact that his marriage to Diana had been a disaster, Charles turned his back on his young wife. The sad thing is that he was so indifferent to Diana that I don't think um, he would have minded if it had been uh, a road sweep or something, because I think that uh, well, perhaps it would have given him more ammunition to be critical of her. I don't, I don't think he cared. And of course, indifference is one of the worst things in a relationship. It was at the time of Prince Andrew's wedding in 1986 that Charles and Diana's marriage had, in Charles's own words, irretrievably broken down. Although Fergie's wedding day seemed perfect, the new Duchess of York, an old friend of Diana's, was unsuited to royal life and would make many mistakes. Oblivious to her new sister-in-law's shortcomings, Diana had manoeuvred her friend into the royal life as her ally and to divert attention away from herself. Diana is the most manipulative woman I think any of us has seen in, in all our lifetimes. She has very carefully worked out exactly what her own role is, how far she can go, and she's used Fergie to an enormous extent to, to go in and test the waters. Foolish and feckless, the Duchess of York was the subject of scandals. Her reckless disregard for royal convention had a cumulative damaging effect upon the monarchy. She had a love affair with her flashy American financial advisor, John Bryan, infamously caught sucking her toes by a Riviera pool. And another with his friend, the handsome Texan oil man, Steve Wyatt. Fergie's antics merely acted as a smokescreen for Diana's unhappy marriage. Diana went away to spend a weekend in a country mansion with a young man when no one else was staying in the house long before Fergie went away with Steve Wyatt. Diana was in there testing the waters. She knew what she was going to do. Fergie misbehaved in public before Diana did, but Diana had already done it. This pattern of behavior that we saw come from Fergie, I don't think we'd have seen if Diana hadn't been around.
Friendly rivals, Fergie and Diana kicked against palace restrictions, engaging in behavior which led to their downfall and expulsion by divorce from their privileged positions. There was a close relationship between Sarah and Diana. They were chums and they really were, were close, they had each other. But then that relationship soured as um, Sarah seemed to be getting on better and the Queen was much more affectionate towards Sarah, then I think that caused a certain split between the two and I think a lot of things went on that weren't terribly, <laughs> terribly good news for a friendship, if we put it that way. Um, but then they came back together again towards the, about the time of 1992 when Sarah was wanting to end her marriage to Andrew and there was this kind of, the two of them together had this great scenario that maybe they would do it at the same time and make their bid for freedom. So they would buoy each other up during this time and, you know, that's, that's so they came together again. So it's, a, it's like that. It's a convenient friendship, but probably the only close one in the royal family. The divorced wives of Windsor, mothers of the Queen's grandchildren, are inextricably linked by their past, present and future. They know how much the other suffered at the hands of a dynasty, which ultimately expelled them as rebellious failures. Away from the relaxed atmosphere of a Caribbean holiday, Diana's willful and uncooperative side, known so well to Charles, is often on display when she faces the press. Her truculence and unwillingness to pose or smile on occasions that do not suit her has led to unseemly clashes. Trying to live two conflicting lives, Diana strives to attain maximum publicity for her limited public role and virtual obscurity for her private life. Even on holiday, the cameras follow her. Oh, I'm getting lost. Diana feels a victim, persecuted and harassed, but she loves the limelight. Only one thing is worse than being constantly photographed, not being photographed at all. The greatest trick Diana ever pulled was convincing the world that she is the victim, because now everybody believes it. Diana's determination to give paparazzi photographers a hard time can lead to farcical situations, such as this incident at the end of a holiday in Spain. Suddenly all seemed to get silly when Diana got hold of this tennis racket and put it up in front of her face. I was walking backwards and at one point I was trying to focus. The tennis racket had Prince Extender written across the front of it. And I thought this was a really funny picture, so I was trying to focus on the Prince bit. And I didn't realize that I'd stopped to focus. And this Prince Extender was getting closer and closer and closer. And suddenly my lens just went black when she just bumped into me. And I said something like, oh, sorry which seemed really silly, con uh, you know, considering the situation we was in. So I carried on walking backwards, and I was aware that there was a door behind me. I suddenly realised it was a lift, that we were going into a lift. I was walking backwards into a lift. And this hand just grabbed my shoulder, and I knew it was Diana, and she just pulled me out of the lift, and I immediately jumped in after her. And then this BA official just said, out, out, O-U-T, out. Out, O-U-T, out. Have a nice trip, man. Which I thought was really, really funny, because when we were kids, my dad used to say, out, O-U-T, out. And I, I remember feeling very endeared to this guy. Sometimes Diana's sullen attitude is evident on her way to engagements, where she can expect to be photographed but refuses to cooperate. Diana uses the press. If you see a decent picture of Camilla Parker Bowles in the paper, then as sure as God made apples green, the following day you'll get an even better one of Diana. Diana stole Charles's thunder the day he appeared in a television documentary admitting his adultery with Mrs. Camilla Parker Bowles. 
This startling TV revelation had made headline news until he was upstaged by his glamorous wife. And everybody remembers the night of um, the Dimbleby interview when Prince Charles admitted um, an affair with Camilla Parker Bowles. Look how Diana turned up at the Serpentine Gallery. I mean, my God, that was just brilliant. I applauded her for it. I thought it was great. But that's just, you know, that's, that's what Diana does. She, she, she manipulates and she's very good at it. Diana stunned onlookers with her low-cut Cinderella-style dress, clearly enjoying her celebrity status. However, there are times when Diana shares fears common to ordinary women, particularly when she's out on her own. I'd found her car parked near Beecham Place, and I was walking kind of fast on the other side of the street, and she kept glancing over her shoulder at me, and she increased her pace. This wasn't the Princess of Wales being harassed by the paparazzi. This was a lone woman in a dark back street in London being followed by a man dressed in black. But I realised that it was quite frightening for her. So I said, uh, Mom, and she turned around and she went, Oh, God, it's you. It was the only time that I've ever had a decent conversation with Diana. And, my God, she can turn it on like you, you've never seen. I've never seen... I've never been face to face with such beauty at that close range. I've never seen such, such, such eyes. And the way Diana talks, when she talks to you, she, she's not as tall as me, she's slightly smaller than me, but she sort of moves her right hip and puts her head down and it, it literally pulls you into her and you, you feel like you're being pulled in. And she just said, um, I said, look, I, I'll see you around. And she said, not if I see you first. Posing alone in front of the Taj Mahal was one of her cleverest tricks, sending out a message of frustration at her husband's absences and at his private disregard for her. she did treat her foreign tours with a solemn purpose, remembering the importance of representing Britain abroad. She often did this against a background of sniping criticism from faceless enemies at home, who feared that her glamorous style raised her profile higher than her husband's. Diana could be courteous and respectful of other cultures, yet always allowing her own mesmerizing qualities to come through. Because of this, Diana was received with genuine warmth in places where other members of her husband's family might not have been. It is little wonder that Diana wanted to be an ambassador for Britain to use well the acclaim she received. As Princess of Wales, she showed skill and diplomacy many politicians would envy, building bridges and cementing international friendships along the way. She has travelled far from her first tentative public speech to the people of Wales in 1981, when she was already expecting her first child, Prince William. I look forward to returning many times in the future. And also, I'd like to just add how proud I am to be princess of such a wonderful place. Years later, with great maternal pride, Diana took William to Wales on St David's Day, presenting him as the future king. William's role provides Diana with her greatest expectations and he may be the best hope for the future of the British monarchy. Prince William and his brother Harry have given Diana the emotional support to carry her through her worst years. They are the real source of her strength. She has strived to bring them up differently from the formal manner of earlier royal generations. Mm. 
By providing a series of adventurous thrills, Diana has tried to give them exposure to people and situations far removed from Charles's own upbringing. However, Diana's obsession with press intrusion has affected William. Finding the paparazzi's coverage of their ski trips overwhelming, William has now refused to return to the scenes of his mother's battles with photographers. Excuse me. Could I ask you to respect my children's space? Yes, sir. Because I brought the children out here for a holiday. Right. We've had 15 cameras following us today. As a parent, I want understand? to protect the children. A lot of the time, Diana shouts and screams at the press when her children are there for, for no reason. And um, she actually draws attention to herself. A schoolboy at Eton College, William is deeply sympathetic to his mother's difficulties. Diana's interview on television revealed a lot about her private life. Being caught in a war between his parents is the fate William shares with many children of split homes. Diana's turbulent public dramas are something the teenage prince has come to dread. I was in the high street and I saw Diana's car pull in to um, the schoolyard where William's house is. And it was odd because she didn't get out of the car. That all the kids were at church. Church ended, and William came out of the church. He walked past Diana's car, and she called out to him. She she got out of the car, and said, "William, William." It was an incredible scene because William was visibly upset, and she was trying to explain to him, and it was as if as he, he couldn't grasp it. Um, and I was sh taking pictures of them, and and I really was amazed by what I was seeing. And uh, then afterwards, William just walked away. A detective once said to me at, at Eton College that William dreads hearing his mum's car on the gravel because it just means more trouble and that she races up there every time. Every time there's an, another disaster is coming in the news of the world, you know, a Will Carlin, an Oliver Hoare, a James Hewitt-style disaster, um, up she goes, straight up the M4, see the kids, tell them before the papers tell them. By giving her son's lavish holidays in exotic locations, Diana could be accused of sometimes spoiling her children. is overcompensating her sons for the distress of their parents' bitter separation and divorce. I think that Prince William has understood it for a great number of years, too long in a way, because uh, he was very disturbed and unhappy at the time of the breakup and the divorce and uh, became very protective of her. And this is going to be interesting because that bond is probably just going to be stronger and stronger. Diana's compulsive need to be the most important influence in her boys' lives has led to jealousy of anyone she thought trying to supplant her maternal role. Diana was furious when Charles's friend Tiggy Leg Burke formed a close but short-lived attachment to her sons. Prince Harry 
appears to be a more easygoing little fellow. Um, but um, he, too, has suffered another loss in the sense that, first of all, his mother is ousted. And then Prince Charles moves in Tiggy Leg Burke to be a sort of substitute nanny mother figure. And now, capriciously, she's been fired. She's out of his life. So he's lost, well, he sees his mother, of course, but he's lost two sort of stable presences in his life. And um, I think very disturbing for those little boys. Diana's lack of direction in life and her unfulfilled emotional needs could place a burden on her sons at times when they will need a more solid foundation for maturity. I actually think that children um, find it much more comfortable if mummy or daddy remarry because um, as they grow older, these boys, um, they want their mother to be happy but they don't want it to be too dependent. And that is a very, it's a dangerous syndrome as, as, as they get older. Um, so it would be ideal if she met um, Prince Charming number two. Uh, it would be a weight off their minds uh, and somebody that they liked, rather than this lonely, beautiful, shadowy figure wanting to share their life rather too much. Enjoying a holiday in the sun with her family, Diana will try to avoid her mother's pitfall of a second failed marriage, which would be disastrous for her and disappointing for her sons. Diana is not destined for a life in the shadows, unlike her mother. Diana's enemies long forecast that she would copy her mother Frances, nicknamed the Bolter, when she left Diana's father for another man. I think she's a sad lady. I think that she needs a bit of attention. I think she needs a lot of love. Uh, things haven't gone well for Francis Shankid. While Diana and her mother may have shared similar destructive experiences, Diana will hopefully not be destined to share her fate. My mother, like daughter, except Diana is so much more powerful, so much stronger. Diana is able to cope with it. Mrs. Shan Shankid is not, is not a good coper. In recent times, Diana has looked to another good coper, her former stepmother, Rain, now divorced from her third husband. She used to call um, her stepmother, you know, the stepmother from hell. But somehow now that she herself is divorced and a, a woman on her own, those two meet and have very cosy, giggly lunches in the Ritz. Despite virtual isolation in her remote Scottish home, Frances keeps in regular contact with her children and grandchildren. Diana now understands both her mother and stepmother better. Well, I think both relationships are on the mend. I mean, that's what's quite interesting. But again, this comes with growing up oneself. By the time you've had children and you're going through perhaps some difficult times with your own growing children, you start to have more sympathy and understanding for the mother who may have had all her own problems and at the time that you were growing up or Diana was growing up. So I think as she grows older, the difficulties that there were in the early stages of the relationships with both her mother and with Rain will be eased, I think, with age comes understanding and forgiveness and all those good things. Diana's circle of staff and women friends has changed rapidly. Some former close friends have gone. And a more recent addition to Diana's diminishing circle is Jemima Khan, the young wife of cricketer-turned-politician Imran Khan. I don't think she has formed much in the way of relationships with other women since, since the divorce. I think that her, her circle of friends has just shrunk and shrunk. And other women do have a problem identifying with her and knowing how to handle her. I would think Diana needs friends more than anyone else on this planet that I can think of right now. Pursuing her Queen of Hearts role, Diana identifies with needy people, projecting her caring image and a need for physical contact. Hugging has no harmful side effects. If we all play our part in making our children feel valued, the result will be tremendous. There are potential huggers in every household. It's this tactile style that has marked Diana out from the more reserved royal family she married into. <laughs> Giving love is still her trademark. 
The plight of starving children does not go unnoticed by Diana. Like so many celebrities, she has used her fame to attract attention to their desperate state. Diana has always done it her way. In Zimbabwe, she ladled out some of the food herself, earning the nickname Di the Dinner Lady. This compassionate touch contrasts with Charles's worthy but unimaginative campaign. This is simply not the style of the House of Windsor. While her enemies regard her as uneducated and her efforts to help others as stunts to upstage Charles, Diana continues her mission to spread love and peace. Before divorce removed the title Her Royal Highness, Diana enjoyed some government support. Now cut off from organizational help, which smooths her progress, Diana battles on. By visiting the killing fields of Angola, Diana is able to draw the world's attention to the millions of unexploded landmines, still taking their toll on the young and innocent in a country trying to pick itself up from a long and bloody civil war. Her efforts were criticized. She was called a loose cannon. I'm only trying to highlight a problem that's going on all around the world. Public success takes its personal toll. Diana constantly seeks new horizons, new projects, new people to help, while neglecting her private happiness. Simply because she is an impossible lady to deal with. It was described to me that she is never relaxed, she never lets go, she never can go out and enjoy herself. She's always thinking, is this the, is, should I be making this move? Should I be doing that? Should I be being photographed? Should I be in a hospital? She very rarely goes out to eat these days. She eats most of her meals in the palace. She hasn't been on a shopping spree that we know of for some time. She's not even been to the Caribbean for weeks. Loneliest woman in London, I would think, without any shadow of doubt, the loneliest woman in London. I think that uh, she spends a lot of time behind palace walls looking at what she can do in the future. And I think she's quite desperate to find a role for herself. Other wilderness years ahead for Diana, or will she find a new role and new happiness before her son William becomes king?